Hello, my name is Michael Sandel. Welcome to The Global Philosopher. In Brazil, Mateus. To blame uh, the rich countries for uh, global warming when we didn't even knew about the consequences during the Industrial Revolution seems to be immoral. I don't think you can expect those relatively poor countries to pay for a climate change. Alfred, in the US. The market mechanism actually might get in the way of a more permanent long-term goal, because our long-term goal is to be able to ha live a life where we're free from using so much carbon. But what the market does, and we see it right now, is that it squanders resources and ingenuity in the wrong way. I'm standing in a studio in Boston in front of a wall of video screens with 60 participants from 30 countries around the world. Our topic is climate change. Our question is, who should pay for it? Suppose the US or Switzerland agrees to cut emissions by 25%. But it would be costly and politically difficult to cut back that much on their own air conditioning and driving habits. So they pay to reduce pollution somewhere else in a developing country. For example, they might pay India to replace highly polluting kerosene lamps and stoves with energy efficient lighting and cooking devices. The reduced emissions from those Indian villages would count toward the US or the Swiss target. Some people say it's an efficient way of reducing global emissions at the lowest possible cost. Others say it makes pollution a luxury good and lets rich countries buy their way out of shared sacrifice. Here is the poll. Is global carbon trading ethical or unethical? Let's see what people think. 30% say it's ethical, 70% say unethical. In Calcutta, India, Beth, what do you think? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, what I basically think is that the main goal here is to basically mitigate the effects of climate change and well, you actually mentioned a very pressing issue about the kerosene lamps and uh, stoves which is actually a very big issue out here not just in the villages but in the cities as well i live in calcutta and there are no dearth of these out here either so uh, if the us or a rich country for that matter helps us out and uh, actually helps us to replace these um, kerosene stoves and lamps with something more energy efficient and cost efficient i don't see where the problem is global carbon trading is not the actual one solution, but it is a very good solution. It's, Go ahead. Go ahead. It's, we are really, when you say this, it's really focused on like a short term goals of one side. It's actually thinking like a very short term like men mentality. And when you think of the big picture, we're not like uh, helping each other at all. Like when you think about like fairness, fairness is, means like everyone has the duty to help with this, to understand that like if we don't, reduce our emissions in a global perspective, we're gonna go in the wrong direction. Let's turn now, we've got a number of people who, have, who are observing this discussion live online. And David, the BBC has been uh, receiving their responses to this debate. Dave, w what have we heard? Yeah, so we're getting lots of interest from people watching from around the world. Let me just read out a couple of comments. Joe says that carbon trading is a complete distraction. And what's important is that we change the way we live our lives. Uh, and Mitra from the United States says that the proposed taxes on countries or the carbon offsetting for emissions is like committing a sin and then paying arms to the religious leader and asking for, 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 for get forgiveness. All right, let's take up that last analogy. Some, <laughs> some compare tradable carbon uh, permits to buying indulgences. Back in medieval days, there were those who, who sinned, who paid a certain amount to the church in, in hopes or the expectation that that monetary payment, the purchase of an indulgence, as they were called, would offset their transgressions. Buying salvation. Don in the Netherlands, um, would you like to reply 
to this analogy between tradable emission permits, carbon, global carbon trading, and the buying of salvation in medieval days. Do you think that's morally an apt analogy? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I think uh, the, the buying of salvation is about uh, forgiveness and the buying of uh, emis emission rights uh, or global carbon trading is about results. So I think you can be more pragmatic when it comes to the climate because it's in all our interest that the climate change is, is um, stopped. So I think the result is more important. So Don says the principal distinction between global carbon trading and buying indulgences for sal or, or salvation is that pragmatism and efficiency are appropriate in the case of reducing carbon emissions, but not in these other areas. Um, who disagrees with Don? Who thinks that it is a good analogy and can reply to Don's argument? Um, Hazel in Hong Kong. Yeah, I think that one thing that's missing from this debate, it's that it's very framed around like who can buy, who can sell, and do we have like an inherent right to exploit the earth? Is that really the attitude that we want to have towards our behavior and how it impacts on the planet? Do we want our relationship with the earth to be reduced to how much we can exploit it and how much we can bounce back from it? Okay, so back to Don, and let's put both Don and Hazel on the screen. Hazel has a pretty good counter-argument, doesn't she? She says it's not only results in terms of tonnage of carbon emissions that matter. It's cultivating the right kind of yes. attitudes toward, toward nature, toward the planet. Do I have it right, Hazel? Yeah. What do you say to that, Don? Yes, um, I'm sensitive to that argument because it's also about a, a good attitude we have to create. But in the meantime, we have, well, say, a, a certain amount of euros, and we have to put them on the place where we can uh, uh, do best for the climate, I think. And is it in China? It will be in China. What about that, Hazel? I think, like, yeah, while I see where that's coming from, we do have a limited amount of things, like things that we can use to help fix the problem. I think it would be more like, I, I don't like using the word, but more cost effective if we focused on reducing our consumptions, because that way we can also make a tangible change that doesn't necessitate like spending more money or buying more new technology. So you're saying it's not only the results that matter, but the attitude, the spirit in which those actions yes, are undertaken. Don? Can't we do both? You know, this question of attitudes, not only results, but <laughs> attitudes matter reminds me of a website set up by some critics of carbon trading. They offer the opportunity to offset infidelity. So that, for example, if someone is married and cheats on his or her spouse, um, it's possible to go online and pay someone in another city to be faithful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the website, the website, <laughs> Don, it's called cheatneutral.com. <laughs> a very good idea, but I don't think it's working uh, in personal relationships. Okay, but, I, but the, the issue here, and we're coming to really the heart of the <laughs> philosophical question, the issue here is whether global cooperation to reduce carbon emission is akin to cultivating personal relationships, or whether it's more like a business transaction. Suppose we discovered a technological fix to climate change that enabled us to continue our current patterns of consumption and energy use without damaging effects on the climate, the oceans, and the environment. Would this be an unqualified good, or would it be a mixed blessing, averting the threat of climate change, but removing the impetus to reform our consumerist ways and to rethink our relation to nature? Tell us, in reply to the poll, 
whether you would consider this technological fix an unqualified good or a mixed blessing. 36% say it would be an unqualified good, 64% a mixed blessing. Let's hear first from someone who thinks it would be an unqualified good. Um, Mateus in Brazil. The consumer's culture, the only problem with it is the impact on the environment. So if we can find a way to maintain this culture, but without actually damaging the environment, then there is absolutely nothing wrong with keeping up with the consumer's culture. In Dhaka, Bangladesh, Tamid. Point is actually when we're trying to fix the environment, so we're thinking that we're the master of the world. And the consumer behavior actually allows us or encourages us actually to exploit more. That's why I said it's a mixed blessing. And we have to think about not only the environmental fix, but also other, because this consumer behavior will actually keep us uh, consume more or exploit more. So, Tommy, if I understand you, you're suggesting that what's objectionable about a consumerist way of living and being is that it goes along with an attitude of mastery, you said. Mastery yes. Yes. toward what? Toward nature? Towards nature, society. So I'm the god, and because we shouldn't be act as a master in this universe. I don't know whether I'm making sense or not. No, it's a powerful suggestion. So Tommy s says that what's wrong with a consumerist way of living and being is that it embodies an attitude of mastery toward nature, a lack of humility, a kind of hubris, maybe, that he thinks is misplaced and that is what, the wrong way to be, the wrong way to live, the wrong attitude to have toward the, the natural world. Is there someone who would like to address that way of thinking? In Peru, Kelly. Hi, I completely agree with what has been said. I feel that uh, being from Peru and being surrounded by indigenous people, I'm from the Andes, so I can say that the relationship that one establishes with Earth, it's, it's very cultural. It, it's very different to what I experienced uh, living in the Western hemisphere. And I would also argue that it's de definitely this disagreement on how we establish our relationship to air that is connected to how we disagree and how to solve the climate change issue. Uh, people, indigenous peoples, peoples with eco-environmentalism um, mind, um, minds uh, disagree with, the way, with market systems because they want to see more of a universal solidarity on how to relate to Earth apart from the just economic perspective. Okay, so we've heard from Kelly and from Tamid a powerful statement, a critique of the attitudes associated with consumerism, the attitudes associated with wasteful, exploitative uh, stances toward nature beyond the results. Who can reply to these arguments about attitudes of consumption being corrupting and inadequate to what it means to lead a good life? All right, Beth, in Calcutta. Uh, yeah, uh, there's an issue I would like to raise here. There's something saying you can't go back, you can only go forward. So we can't just stop living our lives the way we do. Can we actually switch on, a, switch off the AC, switch off the lights and, you know, go back to living in the candlelight and without electricity and everything? No, we certainly that. can't do that. We've heard a, an important disagreement about whether we should be pragmatic in dealing with a very urgent, looming global problem and use whatever mechanisms, including market mechanisms, might help. And we've heard a competing argument that the challenge of climate change is partly to reduce emissions, but is also to use the challenge of climate change as an occasion to rethink consumerist and materialist ways of living. And we've heard the debate. We've not resolved it. But I think we can draw, well, at least one conclusion. We know that contending with climate change involves hard negotiations among countries. What we've seen today is that it also requires hard thinking 
about some big philosophical questions about the meaning of justice in a global setting. Questions about the tension between economic efficiency and global solidarity. Questions even about how we should understand our relation to nature and to the planet we share. These are questions that today we must think through together, very much as we've been doing here in the company of people from different countries, from different cultures around the world. And so to our participants, to our listeners, to our viewers online, I want to thank you for joining me for this episode of The Global Philosopher. You did a great job.